A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 4. Today, we will continue discussing the case of Jennifer Doherty, who was a sweet, caring, 30-year-old woman. She was brutally tortured and then murdered in the early morning hours of February 11, 2010. All Jennifer wanted was to be loved and to love. Her trusting nature and sweet disposition unfortunately made her a target for the Greenberg Six. Join in to listen to the continuation of the gruesome story and conclude the story of Jennifer Doherty. This two-part series is a revision of an episode we originally aired January 9th of 2022, Wolfpack of Greensburg, The Murder of Jennifer Doherty. With that, I'm Amanda Cronin. And I'm Courtney Fenner. And A Nefarious Nightmare presents Her Light Continues to Shine, The Murder of Jennifer Doherty, Part 2. I encourage you to listen to part one if you haven't already, because once again, this story is especially long and detailed. But a brief recap, Jennifer Doherty was a 30-year-old intellectually disabled woman with a kind heart and trusting nature. She had unfortunately befriended a group of people who inevitably tortured her, sexually assaulted her, and ultimately murdered her. In part one, we went into some detail as to how all of this started, being that one of the main offenders in this case, Angela Marinucci, as well as her boyfriend, Ricky Smyrns, instigated an imagined love triangle between them and Jennifer. Jennifer did not realize this was happening, and because of Marinucci's jealousy, she became the subject of a brutal torture at the hands of six people five of whom was following the lead of Marinucci. Please, if you haven't listened yet, stop here and listen to part one to get the full story so that part two will be a lot easier to understand. To continue, Marinucci, Smyrns, and Knight, after a long evening of beauty rest and relaxation, you know, after a hard day of hard work, leave the apartment to go cash a check. This time, though, they employ manager, Masters and Miller to watchdog Jennifer and tell them that if they let her leave, bad things will happen to them. Now, Emma Kinney did a great job on this case, and she did a fantastic job at trying to simmer some humanity and even the cowards. But the one thing I want to state here, I don't give a damn if these people were scared of Knight, Marinucci, and Smyrns. The three of them were grown and had minds of their own. Maybe they witnessed what had happened to Jennifer, but they had more than enough leeway to get her out of there and get her help and still be safe. These three, in my opinion, are just as bad as onlookers who, instead of reaching out to help a victim, take video on their phone for TikTok. They could have had just as easily gotten a phone and gotten law enforcement involved. So... They return, and the first thing Marinucci does is accuse Jennifer of drinking soda from the fridge. Jennifer denies this, and she's just spent an entire 24 hours being made to drink random things she didn't even want to drink. One of the things being cooking oil, and they didn't care. They'd already decided that Jennifer drank this non-existent soda, and then they push her to the floor, climb onto her, and they begin to punch her in the face. The ones that didn't participate in the beating did say that Jennifer did try to defend herself and manages to knee Marinucci in the stomach, to which Marinucci gets up, runs to Smyrns, tells him she's pregnant, and that Jennifer had killed their baby. This was actually confirmed. She was not pregnant. She was using this as an emotional play to get the pack to do what she wanted. At the time, though, nobody knew that, and Smyrns is now pissed. 
saying, why should you be allowed to live? I know you killed my child. So Smurns begins to hold what he calls family meetings. So during these meetings, they're trying to figure out what to do with Jennifer. And at this point, Jennifer is just barely hanging by a thread. She's been raped, beaten, and drugged, and also forced to drink these really disgusting elixirs that I'll bring up shortly. They decide during this meeting that they take a barely conscious Jennifer to a bathroom. Knight and Menger are the ones that take her there, and Knight then beats Jennifer over the head with a metal towel rack. They all decide that she needs to drink quote-unquote pregnant pee because, quote, it's stronger. So Marinucci, who's not pregnant, by the way, pees into a cup, and they force-fed Jennifer with it. Then, because that was not enough, decide to make an elixir which included more pee, Medinger's feces, and spices. They basically made her a bodily waste cake. She tries to refuse it. They beat her and assault her until she finally gives in and is force-fed this stuff. They then decide to make her drink a drink to wash it down made of water, bleach, cigarette butts, and more prescription meds from Metadinger. Metadinger then beats Jennifer until she drinks every bit of it. Smyrns and Knight then drag her back into the living room and decide to grab Christmas lights and tie up her feet with that. Marinucci plugs them in and says she wants to make her a Christmas tree. The lights do not work and Marinucci is raging. They remove the bowls from the wire so that they can feasibly tie her legs together. And then they take one of those Christmas garlands, you know, the ones that you decorate your trees with. They take one of those, they tie it around her feet. They paint her face up with nail polish that Miller had owned. And then they've basically dehumanized her at this point. They then take turns kicking her in the stomach because they all believe it's possible that she's pregnant with Smyrn's baby. They beat her with anything that they could find. A vacuum cleaner and a crutch were mentioned at one point. All Jennifer is wanting at this point is just to go home. At this point, where Jennifer is begging and pleading to be let go so that she can be with her family, Smyrns decides to hold another family meeting where they have to make a decision as to whether she should live or die. Every member of this meeting voted death because they thought murder would incur less of a punishment than assault. So Smyrns then goes and asks Jennifer if she wants to live or die. Can you even imagine going through all that? Potentially overhearing these people unanimously vote in favor of your death and then being asked that? That's absolutely terrifying. But she pleads to live and maintains her innocence saying that she did nothing wrong. Smyrns then said, quote, except you did. You attempted to kill my child, end quote. And by the way, again, there was no baby. Smyrns then made Jennifer write a suicide note and said to her, quote, we're going to kill you and we're going to make it look like a suicide so that we are not held accountable, end quote. The intent was to put the note in her pocket so that she were found it would be deemed a suicide instead of a homicide. The note that they forced her to write said, quote, I haven't been very happy for a while, and I also feel like everyone will be better without me on earth. I will always love my mom, stepdad, no matter what, and I will always love the rest of my family also. My nieces and nephew would be lucky to have a better aunt than me, and I am done with life. Goodbye, Jennifer. End quote. Then Marinucci says, just kill that bitch. They take her to the bathroom, they turn the light off, and they make her kneel down. Smyrns hands Knight an eight-inch knife from the kitchen and says, quote, you know what to do. Knight said, quote, I can't. And Smyrns follows up with, me neither, man. Knight then goes to the bathroom, stuffs something in Jennifer's mouth to keep her quiet, asks her if she's ready to die, and then repeatedly stabs her in the chest, in the side of her body, in her neck, and then slices her throat. Knight then leaves the bathroom and said, Dang, this bitch ain't dead. And by the way, that's quoted. Marinucci then says, quote, You have to kill her. Just do it. I want her out. Knight passes the knife to Metadinger, who passes it to Smyrns, who goes to the bathroom. Zero empathy, like a robot. 
and slits her wrist. Marinucci is continuously screaming, just kill that bitch, I can't believe she isn't dead, and also keeps saying, I don't know what he saw in her, and then proceeded to call her the hard R word while Jennifer's in there dying. Despite all of this, Jennifer still hasn't died. Smyrns and Knight decide they have a plan as to how they're going to finish her off. They grab the Christmas lights and use these lights to strangle her. And it is at this point, 30-year-old Jennifer Doherty passes and up until now had been tortured for three whole days. Jennifer Doherty is tortured for three days, forced to write her own suicide note, and then these people murdered her. Can you imagine what she must have been thinking in those last moments? This is a woman who is incredibly close with her family, but this is the last thing they hear or see of her. After this, there's a new family meeting at this point that I imagine is akin to a Charles Manson family meeting. But anyway, this family meeting is to discuss what to do with her body. Masters suggest putting her body on the train tracks... Marinucci then suggests burning her body in front of a church. How fucking dramatic. Medinger suggests putting her in the trunk of a car. Smyrns suggests putting her in a trash can and moving it somewhere remote so that they wouldn't be caught. Ultimately, they go to a neighbor's house and steal their trash can. They then put Jennifer's body in a plastic bag and shove her head first into the trash can. After this, Smyrns and Knight grab a bunch of towels and bleach and clean up the blood. At one point, Marinucci comes up with this realization that Smyrns loves her more because he killed Jennifer. Marinucci then realizes that she's bored now because she finally got what she wanted. You know the type. A woman who enjoys the chase, but once she's caught, it's downhill from there. So she decides that she's out of Smyrns' league. She decided that she is better than him because Smyrns is now a murderer. Now, before we continue, we know what you're thinking. Something along the lines of, wait a minute, only Smyrns? He's the only murderer in this? Let us explain and summarize. And you have to understand that thought process, kind of, to, to get what we're implying. All six of these people were compliant in what Marinucci wanted. They all did what they were told. Smyrns and Knight essentially finished Jennifer off. Marinucci took it as some profession of love from Smyrns, decided that she's no longer into that, and even though she is ultimately the ringleader in all of this, she still didn't physically murder anyone. So while she's just as guilty as everyone else, if not more so, kind of like a female modern-day Charles Manson, who also didn't actually murder anyone, by the way. She just doesn't see it that way. Please understand what we're trying to say, which is that Marinucci is probably the most guilty of all of them. Her ego fully got into the way, her jealousy also got in the way, and any guilt she felt was projected onto Smyrns. In her mind, she did nothing wrong, but to a normal person with a normal and logical thought process, she was the full-blown instigator and essentially a cult leader. But make no mistake, all six of them, in some form or fashion, played a role, no matter how big or small, in the murder of this beautiful soul. So Smyrns and Knight leave the early next morning with a trash can containing Jennifer's body, and they arrive at Greensburg Salem Middle School. The parking lot is covered in snow. They shove part of the trash can underneath a truck and continue about their way. These people are clearly intelligent, murderous masterminds. Nobody is ever going to suspect anything. Nobody will ever know. Like, it's genius. And we're willing to bet that their IQ is super high. It's in the high tens, for sure. So now that their quote-unquote problem is out of the way, they head back to the apartment and it's time for them to just go to sleep. Again, because they've worked so hard at this absolutely senseless and horrific murder and torture. So a few hours later, the driver of the truck immediately finds the trash can shoved under his truck. He pulls the trash can out and the lid pops open. He then smells the smell of decomp and all of the other shit that they had thrown on her in the days previous and discovers Jennifer's body inside 
which really just had to be rough on that truck driver. I mean, that's some PTSD shit right there. Police arrive pretty immediately on the scene and take her body to a forensic pathologist. They notice all of the odd things. The Christmas lights on her neck and wrists, the garland around her feet, weird smells like spices and bleach, and just things that aren't typically consistent with decomp. Police figure out pretty quickly that this is Jennifer Doherty. So during her autopsy, they discovered numerous stab wounds several medications in her system, like Zoloft and the antipsychotic we mentioned earlier. They found that the levels of these drugs were higher than what would be needed to cause an overdose and death. The wound that was the most severe was the one that was on the left side of her chest. It pierced her lung and her heart. All of the things that happened to her contributed to her death, but that one was the one that ultimately killed her. Police got reports of a disturbance at Smyrn's apartment around the time consistent with what had happened, which it's infuriating because a neighbor said that over the past few days, he heard some noises coming from that apartment that he thought were highly unusual. He noted that one sounded like a body being slammed and he had also heard screaming. And why weren't the police called in this moment? That's just, it's a mystery. And don't worry, we have a hard time understanding this as well. But we have to remember, while I personally fully stand by see something, say something, or even hear something, say something, he very likely didn't want to jump the gun and get too involved just in case it was nothing. I get it. It's better to report something, though, and it be nothing, than to not report something, and it be Jennifer Doherty found in a trash can stuffed underneath a truck. We have a duty, as human beings, to do something. None of us should be rubbernecking in a situation that could potentially be bad. And some people will say, don't be a hero in a situation where you can likely be killed. Yes, don't be a hero. But if you have a feeling that something sinister is happening next door, fucking call the police. She potentially could have been saved. But instead, this was allowed to continue to the sheer nature of ignoring what was happening And we're not saying that the neighbor is completely to blame. I'm not saying that he's a murderer, but he still could have called the police. So they start receiving some reports and calls, and then the police go around knocking on some doors to maybe see if there were any witnesses or even people who may have heard something or know something. And Marinucci gets a text informing her that a body was found at the middle school. Now, it's unclear who sent this text, but our thinking is that it was an anonymous text from someone that knew about the beef that Marinucci had with Jennifer. This entire time, Jennifer's family has zero clue about any of this. They're just wondering where Jennifer is. Jennifer's sister calls Smyrn's apartment. Peggy Miller answers the phone because at this point, Smyrn's is out with his caseworker. She asks Peggy if she knows where Jennifer is, and Peggy's like, nope, no idea. Then Smyrns calls and tells Peggy to leave the apartment basically in so many words that the cops are hot on this and that he and Marinucci were taken in for questioning by the police. They then eventually grab Knight, Masters, Miller, and Metadinger because there's obviously more questions. The police are obviously and finally on to all of them at this point. During questioning, they all pointed their finger at each other with blame because, you know, Who's going to take accountability in this? Like, let's be real. So basically, the Greensburg Six, as they would become to known, all point fingers at each other. Marinucci wasn't even considered a suspect at this point, though. But they, of course, had their suspicions. But actually, they thought that she was just someone who might have some information, but wasn't actually involved. The police search the apartment and find some very obviously incriminating evidence, like a knife, an area with some Christmas lights strewn about, a metal pole with blood on it, the crutch we mentioned earlier, among other things. It's here that Marinucci admits that there's beef between her and Jennifer, which the police find interesting. She's basically said that they were fighting over Smyrns. She then said that at the bus station, they mended their friendship and that there was no problem, which obviously is a bunch of bullshit, but the police don't know this yet. She then continues by saying that the other five were still pissed at Jennifer because she was acting like a homewrecker. 
So Marinucci fabricates the story of a trust bond between her and the other five as though they'd really care if Jennifer really wanted to involve herself in this affair or not. Despite the squashed beef, so that the story is fishy. Think about it, y'all. Why would you mend ways with someone and call a truce? And then other people still want to beat you up? That's not normal behavior. It's very obvious to police that she's lying at this point because that story just makes zero sense. I'm sure that the police in this situation were like, you can't bullshit a bullshitter. You know, and none of it lined up. You don't just say, hey, so she was trying to fuck my man, but we all met at this bus station, hugged it out. People still felt betrayed on my behalf, so they killed her. And you know, the police aren't going to be all, all right, well, it's obviously you did nothing wrong, so you're free to go. I mean, basically at this point, she just implicated herself. She told a story, it completely backfired. So the police were like, nope, because after this, she further implicated herself by saying that the rest of the group did all of the things, including tying her up with the Christmas lights, basically giving away all of this information, right? And then, you know, after the fact that they supposedly squashed their beef, she admitted to punching Jennifer. They quickly find out that she is one of the main characters of this entire ordeal. She organized this entire thing in that she is 110% guilty of all of it. After questioning, Marinucci faces charges of first and second degree murder, conspiracy to murder, and conspiracy to kidnapping and kidnapping. She pleaded not guilty to all counts. So now this goes to trial. Medinger testified against everyone, but especially Marinucci, and then pled guilty to murder, despite her attorney advising her otherwise. She also said, quote, I have evidence if you need it. So Medinger has a conscience after all. I mean, still a piece of shit in my book, but somewhat of a conscience. There was no plea deal offered. She sincerely pled guilty because she actually felt guilty and knew she was guilty. Now, she did avoid the death penalty because of this, but Menger didn't realize that would be the result. She did what she did because she truly felt it was the right thing to do. She had nothing to lose. It's noted that her testimony was every prosecutor's dream. She was given 40 to 80 years in prison, and it's highly unlikely she will step outside a free woman. There was more evidence against Marinucci from an inmate overhearing Marinucci, Miller, and Metadinger discussing what had happened. This inmate, along with others, would talk to Marinucci, and she straight up told them all what she did to Jennifer. Rule number one, in jail, in prison, nobody is your friend. If someone thinks that the information they can get can get them something, they will bump their gums. And even if you do make friends as an inmate, imagine telling one person a secret in a small town. Five minutes later, everyone knows your secret. I've never been to jail, and even I know that. Snitches get stitches. But evidently, they did not like Marinucci. And maybe there are some exceptions to that rule. They likely saw her as the equivalent of a child killer, which is definitely something that is not liked in prison by inmates. Now, if y'all have been listening to this uh, podcast for a while, you've noticed that we've changed our format and all that. And you've noticed that it's pretty rare that we interject our personal, you know, opinion. But this bitch, I swear to God... Uh, Marinucci was then telling them all the details, including how she wanted Jennifer dead and even praised Smyrns on a job well done cleaning up the crime scene. She was bragging and it's likely the other inmates weren't exactly as pleased about this as she was. One thing is they were all eating this stew and they had commented on how the stew looked like dog shit, which it actually looked like vomit from what I saw. But anyway... Marinucci had said, that's okay, I feed feces too, and then there's that hard R word that we will not say. There was another time where she goes, quote, does anyone need a drink? I'll give people bleach to drink. So cold, no remorse, no guilt, and she gave zero fucks. 
but she was pleased with herself. Marinucci is found guilty in all counts. But for her sentencing, they looked at her background and found that Marinucci had a middle-class upbringing with a stable family. She said she was raped when she was 13, which we can all agree is horrific. But it's also not believed to be true. Not to mention that while rape can be a trauma, and there are trauma responses associated with that, there are people that live today as wonderful human beings that would not murder a 30-year-old with the mental capacity of a 12-14 to year old because they were raped. She also alleged that Smyrns raped her at the time of Jennifer's murder. Now, Smyrns is definitely a piece of shit, and I'm not trying to defend him at all, but it does look like Marinucci's trying to deflect the atrocity of the crime she committed by making herself look like the victim. Because it's always about her, right? Also, she mentions that the reason why she didn't bring it up until that point in time is because she was scared of losing the relationship she had with Smyrns. And, you know, bringing Emma Kenny back up. She brings up the fact that while you should obviously believe it when a victim says that they've been raped, you should also remember that Marinucci did say that she was pregnant when she wasn't, as well as also lied to the police about the beef she had with Jennifer, which was supposedly squashed. Basically, you're to take everything that Marinucci says with a very, very small grain of salt. Marinucci's mother claimed in court that the one thing that changed her behavior is that when she was 15, she was hit with a truck and sustained injuries, including head trauma. Her family holds a strong to believing that this is a factor that altered her behavior. And I understand that because there are a ton of serial killers, as I believe I mentioned before, that suffered a head injury at a young age and turned out to be the way they are as a result. Something about the frontal lobe being damaged in a still developing brain. And it's important to note that the brain continues to develop well into your 20s, which explains the massive differences in behavior from infancy to adolescence to adulthood. And they say that the development of the brain is a crucial process in adolescence because that is where it majorly shifts. It could affect the impulse control, for example, and also have some long-term issues. A head injury during that time can be detrimental to later behavior. So they allege that after that, she went further down the spiral, started experimenting with drugs, and had issues with mental health, particularly depression. Marinucci also claimed to have psychotic episodes and hallucinations like seeing her dead grandmother— An expert witness that they brought in basically said, yeah, no, not true. Marinucci then asks an inmate, her cellmate actually, how to fake being crazy. I guess she was trying to sway a jury decision with a solid insanity plea. There are some videos I've seen of Marinucci basically being brought into a car or into a courthouse. And I'll link it in the show notes, but you can see her like holding her head and hunching down as if she's trying to look some kind of way. Like it looks like she's acting and she's trying to glean some kind of empathy from an audience. It's bizarre. It's almost laughable to be honest because she's manipulative and cold and also aware of her actions, but she's a bad actor, for sure. The judge then said that her actions were incomprehensible, basically slammed that gavel, and said that she was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And then there was some pushback as to her sentence because she was 17 at sentencing, which, I mean, if you're going to act grown, then I think that you should be treated as such, right? But anyway, in 2012, a Miller versus Alabama case saying it was unconstitutional to sentence her as a juvenile to life without parole, without first considering all mitigating factors. Um, Marinucci then appeals her sentence because of this. In 2015, they look at her case and because of her age, she did avoid the death penalty, but she still got life without the possibility of parole. And even still, to this day, no remorse. She actually uses what she did to Jennifer as this alpha dog tactic in prison. So she's constantly bragging to others about what she did, I guess because she wants to look hard. Sadly, 
As recent as May of 2022, Marinucci was sentenced a third time and was given a possibility of parole in 2070. She would be 78 years old. Joy Burkholder, Jennifer's sister, is clearly saddened and exhausted after having to continually fight these sentences. But to this day, she continues on advocating for her sister, saying, quote, I have faith in the judicial system that this will continue to be worthy of Jennifer's memory. This wasn't an accident. This was not something that somebody stumbled upon. This was a very conscious decision to do horrible, heinous things. End quote. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. But according to WPXI.com, Marinucci spoke via Zoom from her cell and claimed to take responsibility for what happened, saying that she wants to earn the trust of the courts as well as Jennifer's family. A psychiatrist was called by the defense and took the stand. He said he believes Marinucci to be a work in progress and has the capacity to be rehabilitated. The judge also considered Angela's age at the time of the murder, which was 17, as well as her development and maturity, but said Angela has never once taken responsibility for the crime and just sentenced her to 60 years to life in prison with credit for time served. And we don't know how to feel about this, but Jennifer's family said the last 12 years have been grueling for their family to relive over and over again, and they are hoping it can finally just be over with. February 28th, 2013, Smearns is found guilty on all counts. His background was considered the history of severe mental illness, the abuse he suffered as a child, the allegations of rape, all of those factors. They then looked at everything he had done and the severity of it all. A seriously vulnerable person with the mental age of a 14-year-old who he kidnapped, long periods of torture, and how inhumane all of it was, and the fact that he tried to hide what he had done and her body and sentenced him to the death penalty. Smyrns tried to appeal this in 2017, but was denied and he is on death row with a delayed execution date. In August of 2012, Knight's actions were considered equally as heinous as Smyrns. He was guilty on all counts, had the most evidence piled against him, he knew this and straight up pled guilty pretty much right away. He was 20 at the time of this. He had no significant history of previous convictions. The mitigating factors were slim, but the aggravating factors were highly significant. So the court weighed this out to try to create a balance. But Knight was sentenced to the death penalty, which he appealed in 2020, but was also denied and still currently awaiting an execution date. Miller pled guilty and was sentenced to 35 to 74 years in prison. She had a chance to let Jennifer go, but didn't. And that factor, as well as a few others, deemed her heavily involved and made her about as complicit as everyone else because she took part in voting for her death and being involved in these family meetings. Masters pled guilty to third-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to kidnapping and was sentenced to the lightest of them all, which is 30 to 70 years. Same as Miller, being involved in the family meetings and such. They may not have physically did what the other four did, but they still allowed it to happen and participated in the conspiracies to be involved and failed to report, which is pretty much mandatory in just about every U.S. state. The fact that they didn't report this to the police is a huge one, because if they had, again... Jennifer could possibly still be alive today. So they're equally as much involved as the rest. Something came of all of this, though. Jennifer's law. As a result of all of this, Jennifer's law was proposed. It would be a criminal offense to witness a violent crime and not report it. Failure to report the crime would be a misdemeanor violation of the third degree. Here's a quote from Jennifer's sister, Joy Burkholder. She was exploited, and her kindness and handicapped made her very vulnerable. She trusted everybody. She believed 
everyone was good and no one would hurt her. End quote. The following is a message from us to the Greensburg Six and any of their sympathizers. It took six people, six fucking weak-willed people to murder one intellectually disabled woman who was not harming anyone. The six of them murdered one intellectually disabled woman, strung her up like a Christmas tree, made her drink concoctions of urine, shit, bleach, and cigarette ashes, all because one of the six pieces of shit was jealous of someone who just wanted friends. How insecure do you have to be as a woman to feel threatened by someone who does not actually want your boyfriend? Who is just living their life in pure bliss, just being kind? She was completely defenseless. Do these people actually think they'd be okay to roam the earth after that? Do they actually think that people would want to be their friends after that? Horrific past history on some of these monsters aside. And believe me, we have taken that into consideration. But the empathy for these sick fucks just escapes me. What these people did to this woman, equally as bad as what pedophiles do to children and what child murderers do. And not just because of an intellectual disability, these monsters actively planned to torture and kill this woman because of some insecure trash can of a human that felt threatened. I can imagine as a mom, as a parent, I would be out for blood after someone had done this to my kid. So the empathy for her and her loved ones will remain big time. If you're all looking for me to have empathy for these fuckbags who tortured and murdered Jennifer Doherty, you might as well unsubscribe from this podcast because it ain't happening. This woman was absolutely defenseless. Nature versus nurture. We can argue that. We most certainly can. But there are people out there who have endured the worst of the worst and still haven't stooped to the level that these people did. There are people who have endured even worse that would still consider these garbage people privileged. I'm sorry you had to deal with what you did when you were younger. I truly am. But instead of becoming a better person and realizing that you could have risen above this, you decided to have the, if you can't beat them, join them attitude and completely ruin a whole ass, wonderful human and her loved ones. You all are equally as culpable as the monsters that you all dealt with. So quit trying to force their hand and make everybody think that they were the ones that murdered her because it was you that did it. I'm only thankful that you will not do this to anyone else ever again. Jennifer, she had a chance and she had a chance at life and you stole that from her. As a child, you all were defenseless and for that I'm truly sorry you went through that. But the fact that you decided to somehow become even worse than the monsters that did what they did to some of you, the empathy I have for the Greensburg Six just escapes me and served. What a bunch of sick, sad monsters the Greensburg Six were. And what happened to Jennifer was just fucked up. If we had any advice to give anyone, it would be that it's fine to trust people. But not everyone is deserving of trust. And usually, like respect, it's to be built not given willy-nilly. This isn't to blame Jennifer at all. No, this is something we can all learn from. Be kind, but always watch your back. Okay, (laughs) before we wrap up part two of this horrific case, and I actually urge you to do this because you're going to need a palate cleanser after all. Please don't forget to join our Patreon for bonus content, such as our Not So Nefarious Criminals podcast. Each week we will have a guest and we always forget that we have a guest, but it's there it is. You know, that's what it is. We talk about the lighter side of crime, such as Florida man. It's a great palate cleanser. We will also try our best if we can find it to have the original episode up on our Patreon, which was the Wolf Pack of Greensburg, the murder of Jennifer Doherty, since it was the original episode. Despite the fact that I worked hard on it, we weren't happy with it and and it came out bad. Okay, it came out bad. Somebody complained about it and I was hurt by it and I was like, eh, but you're right though. <laughs> it sucked. But anyway, um, we will absolutely, we will leave that off of the public feed. Um, yeah, there it is. 
We will be at the 2023 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas, August 25th through 27th. We are so stoked. There will be a ton of great people there and you do not want to miss out. It's so much fun and you get to be around advocates as well as paranormal and ethical true crime creators and even get to listen to some great speakers. We are hoping to see some of the same vendors we saw last year too like Wicked Lit, Damsel Ninja Nancy, The Baker's Den, and more. Tickets are for sale at truecrimepodcastfestival.com, and we will have stuff to give away. Like everyone we cover on this podcast, Jennifer Doherty, her family and friends are all bees. Jennifer absolutely fits this because she was incredibly tenacious in trying to fight off these assailants, but also vulnerable in the sense that her disability was used against her. She was taken advantage of, bullied, and physically and sexually assaulted. She had various chemicals and spices thrown at her. She was dehumanized. I mean, this is one of the worst of the worst, in my opinion. But it's up to us as humans to protect bees, not harm them or be complicit in harming them. When one person will rip the wings off of a bee, like they did with Jennifer, we all have to circle around and try to repair those wings. Victims and survivors, like bees, are resilient, strong, yet vulnerable. We need bees to survive and thrive in life. We need Jennifer's light to continue to illuminate the world. And while the Greensburg Six did everything they possibly could to put that light out, we will not allow her light to dim. We continue to keep Jennifer's memory alive, and her light will shine brighter each and every single day. Jennifer Doherty was a bee, and without bees, we as humans are doomed. So, always, be vigilant, for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally recorded by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Finner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. You can help us grow our show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. Thank you, and as always, be vigilant.